أعوذ بالله من الشيطان الرجيم بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم آمن الرسول بما أنزل إليه من ربه والمؤمنون كل آمن بالله وملائكته وكتبه ورسله لا نفرق بين أحد من رسله وقالوا سمعنا وأطعنا غفرانك ربنا وإليك المصير لا يكلف الله نفسا إلا وسعها لها ما كسبت وعليها ما اتسبت ربنا لا تؤاخذنا إن نسينا أو أخطأنا ربنا ولا تحمل علينا إصرا كما حملته على الذين من قبلنا ربنا ولا تحملنا ما لا طاقة لنا به واعف عنا واغفر لنا وارحمنا أنت مولانا فانصرنا على القوم الكافرين صدق الله العظيم Jazakallah, thank you. Uh, moving on, today's uh, subject of the speech today, inshallah, will be an Islamic view of Gog and Magog. Inshallah, we'll continue with the speech until uh, Maghrib Salah, which is around about 20 to 8. And we'll have a break till about 8 o'clock, and inshallah, we'll resume. And then straight after, we'll have a Q&A, which will be question and answer session based on the subject uh, that the Shaykh will be discussing today. So without further ado, Shaykh Imran Hussain. الحمد لله وكفى والصلاة والسلام على عباده الذين اصطفى خصوصا على أفضلهم وخاتم النبيين محمد العمين وعلى آله وصحبه أجمعين وبعد فأعوذ بالله من الشيطان الرجيم بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم ونزلنا عليك الكتابة بيانا لكل شيء وهدى ورحمة وبشرى للمسلمين صدق الله العظيم uh, Brothers and sisters in Islam here at the Masjid Al-Huda Masjid Al-Aman in Birmingham in Britain uh, Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh our subject, of course, is entitled An Islamic View of Gog and Magog and uh, the, the methodology for explaining the subject is that always you turn to the Qur'an. That the Qur'an first establish the knowledge of the subject for you. Not, you don't go to the Hadith first, you go to the Qur'an first. And secondly, that when you go to the Qur'an, you must get all the material in the Qur'an on the subject and combine it all as a harmonious whole. And thirdly, that when you go to the Hadith, you, you must ensure that the Hadith is harmonious with the Qur'an. If the Hadith is in conflict with the Qur'an, you put it aside. Uh, there is a book of mine downstairs entitled Methodology for Study of the Qur'an. I wish the Darul will start teaching that book, how to study the Qur'an. If they were studying the Qur'an the way it ought to be studied, you'll get a different answer from the Darul to the subject that I'm lecturing on tonight. The subject is also of tremendous importance because of its direct relevance to the world in which we are living today. One of the things that astonished me when I arrived in Britain for the first time last August, I came to see my grandson. I had not visited Britain for 15, 16 years. I came to see my grandson 
and I didn't, I didn't know what kind of reception I'd get, but I had to see my grandson. He was three years of age, and I'd never seen him before in my life. But I, the British immigration treated me very respectfully. And when I entered Britain to meet my grandson, I found this phenomenal hunger in the hearts of the young people, particularly those born in Britain, for the knowledge of that which explains the reality of the world today from the Quran. It was not being given to them in Britain. And Allah had blessed me with that knowledge. And so they were flocking to me. And that's which is why I have to keep on now returning to Britain, but on short visits and all the sisters are struggling to hear you with the, the mic. Okay. <laughs> we will have to begin with material outside of the Quran, as in this case of Dajjal, because our Prophet ﷺ described him as Al Masih for Dajjal. That's the starting point, not the Quran. Starting point. But then after that, we go to the Quran. Similarly, with this subject. The origins of this subject are located in uh, the fact that the people of Makkah, the Mushrikun of Makkah, who are worshipping idols, could not understand how to assess the claim of a man who was born amongst them and who had lived a life of such distinction of truth that they had given him the name Al-Amin, the truthful one, the trustworthy one. And now he declares, I am a prophet of the one God, like unto Abraham, Ibrahim, Moses, Musa, how can we tell whether or not he is truthful? So they sent a delegation to the rabbis who were in the north, city called Yatrib, today it's known as Medina, uh, to ask the rabbis, how can we tell whether or not he is a prophet? And the, the rabbis responded by saying, ask him these three questions which only a prophet can answer. Oxford University cannot answer. <coughs> ask him about the young men who fled into a cave. Ask him about the great traveller who travelled to the two ends of the land and ask him about the Ruh. And Allah sent down the answers. And uh, we are concerned today with the answer to the question about the great traveller. And the answer is located in Surah al kaf of the Qur'an. I have written a book entitled Surah al kaf in the Modern Age. And in that book we have dealt with all the three questions and the answers to all three questions in that book. Surah al kaf in the Modern Age is available downstairs. In answering the question, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala first repeated the question. And they question thee about Zul Karnain. And Karnain means two Karns. And our methodology in seeking to understand what's the meaning of Karn, karn is to ask the Quran to explain it, to the go outside of the Quran. Karn can mean a horn and Karn can mean an epoch, an age, a people, a generation. But when we go to the Quran for the Quran to explain the Quran, then the, the meaning that comes from the Quran is not horn. Allah does not use the word Karn in the Quran for horn. So this is, <coughs> this is an event now which will be repeated twice. Karnain. Two ages, two epochs, two people. Don't forget that. 
don't forget that too. And Zulkarnain is the one who possesses power that Allah gave to him and uh, who possesses faith in Allah. And so with Zulkarnain, at that age, the first age, power manifests itself in the world on the foundations of faith. Welcome to Mulan Abdul Haq. Power rests on the foundations of faith. When power rests on the foundations of faith, how will power be used? He travels on his first journey to one end of the land. And when he came to the end of the land, it ended in water. And so if he's traveling to two ends of the land, there'll be water here and there'll be water there. So we're now beginning to get some idea of the geography of the subject. You do study geography in Britain, don't you? Okay. So there's a body of water on this side where the sun rises, I mean where the sun sets, which is normally the west, is it? Yeah. And there's another body of water where the sun rises, which is normally the east. I don't know about Britain. But in between there's a land. And he travels to the two ends of this land, the two ends of this land. We know, subsequently, I have to fast forward now, that on one of these journeys, not the first and not the second, but the third one, <coughs> that the rabbis did not ask about. They only asked about the first and the second, because they wanted to know whether he knew about the third. <laughs> and the third led him to Gag and Magag. And our companions were sitting amongst themselves, talking amongst themselves, when Nabi Muhammad Wasallam passed by and asked, what are you talking about? And they said, we are talking about <coughs> Alamatu Sa'a, the signs of the last day. And then he replied in a very famous hadith, that the last day would not come, and then he mentioned ten. And these have come to be known as the major signs of the last day. And among them are Dajjal, the false messiah, al Masihu Dajjal. Number two, Gog and Magog. Number three, the return of the son of Mary. Number four, Dukhan. Number five, Del Batul Ab. Number six, that the sun will rise from the west. Number seven, eight and nine, three earthquakes. But these are earthquakes in which the sun, the, the earth sinks down. So it's called a chas. One in the east, one in the west, and the third one in... No, don't be afraid, not going up. <laughs> the third one in Arabia. And number ten, that the fire would come out of Yemen and drive people to the place of assembly. These are not given in the order in which they will occur. No, no. So amongst them is Gog and Magog. And on the third journey he reaches to Gog and Magog. And he builds a barrier to contain them, which we come to later. But when they are released, when Allah releases them, they're going to pass by the Sea of Galilee on their way to Jerusalem. The word Jerusalem does not occur <laughs> in the Quran and in the Hadith because we have a different terminology for it. The Sea, the sea of Galilee does not occur in the Hadith. We have a different word for it. So don't come and write a whole book and say there's no Jerusalem in the Quran. That's nonsense. <laughs> we have we have Beitul Maqdis. What we call Beitul Maqdis, you call Jerusalem. Okay? So they will pass by 
the Sea of Galilee, but in the Hadith it's not called the Sea of Galilee, it's called Buhaira al Tabariya or Tiberias, Lake Tiberias. If you are passing by the Sea of Galilee and you're heading for Jerusalem, then if you study any geography, you know you're coming from the north. So now our geography of the subject in the Quran is becoming clearer. We're talking about a land which is north of the Holy Land, in which there's a body of water on the left and a body of water on the right, and there's only one that qualifies, only one, <laughs> not two. <coughs> the Mediterranean <laughs> Sea is on the left, but nothing on the right. So it has to be the Black Sea on the left and the Caspian Sea on the right. And the land between them <coughs> would be the land on which he traveled to the two ends of the earth. Here is the Black Sea and here is the Caspian Sea. But don't we have a map with the both? There's the Black Sea. And this is Black Sea again, we don't have it. Yeah, we don't have it. Oh, here we are, there, there we are. This is the Caspian Sea here. This is the Black Sea there. And this is the land that he travels from this direction to this direction. This is the setting of the sun here. And this is the rising of the sun here. So when he reached <laughs> the setting of the sun, Allah gave him the power to pursue whatever objective he chose to pursue. Nothing could stand in his way. When he reached to the Black Sea, he then gave a demonstration of his power at the Black Sea. When power rests on the foundations of faith, how will power be used? This is the first of the Got name. The two. The first time, here we are. Got name. The first time is right here at the Black Sea. And uh, Allah says to him, How will you deal with these people? And he says, Whosoever is guilty of acts of wickedness, oppression, injustice, I'm going to punish them. And when I'm finished with them, and they go to you, you will also punish them. But those who have faith and are righteous in conduct, I will treat them nicely and I'll reward them. This looks like someone who worships Allah. This looks like someone who is a follower of a Nabi. <laughs> okay? This looks like Islam, the way Islam came in the world. We don't tolerate oppression and we reward those who have faith and are righteous in coming. When the second of the two currents is to come, you better watch that area. Watch that area, the Black Sea. Having said that, we now proceed to the second, the second journey. He travels in the direction of the rising of the sun. So he going east. And when he reached to the, to the end of the land, meaning the water, the Caspian Sea, he came across a people, لَمْ مِن دُونِهَا سِتْرَةً He came across a people for whom we had provided nothing to cover them, except that which was natural. Hence, a people living a primitive way of life, and Allah knows best. When power rests on the foundations of faith, how will power deal with a primitive people? Allah responds with only one word, one solitary word. That's the economy of language in the Quran. Kazalik. Meaning, he met them like that, and he left them like that. When power rests on the foundations of faith, power respects the rights 
of even the primitive people. We do not ride roughshod over the rights of even the primitive people to explore and exploit the oil reserves under them. You know, ship them to Siberia and then explore the oil? No. Not when power rests on the foundations of faith. Power puts the rights of human beings first. <coughs> and then he traveled in the third direction. And it was a mountain range, and there you can see the mountain range, the Caucasus Mountains, and there was a pass between the mountains. Only one solitary pass. Maybe we have it. There we are. That's the pass there. That's the pass there. And there is where it's located. In between. Now today that pass is a military highway built by the Soviet Union. When he reached to this pass between the mountains, the Quran gives you a description of the pass. <coughs> it speaks of Sadafain. Sadafain is the two sides of a shell. The two sides of a shell. One side one side like this, you see? and the other side like this, like a shell. Over there again, like a shell. Salafain. <coughs> the geography of the Quran, mashallah, is becoming clearer and clearer. <coughs> to identify the location, you got to be careful with the geography. <coughs> and there he came across the people, la yakaduna yafkahuna kaula whose language could not be understood. Why? Because they had a unique language unrelated to the regional languages. And that is precisely what is the Georgian language to this day. This is Georgia. Yeah. The Georgian language to this day is a language which is unrelated to all its neighbors all the regional language. And these people then said to him at the past, Inna ya'juja wa ma'juja mufsiduna fil up. Surely Gog and Magog are committing facade in our land. Can you help us? Can you build a barrier? They use the word sad, a wall. We are prepared to pay you, if you can build this, to protect us from these evil Gog and Magog who are corrupting us and destroying us. Fasad, corruption and destruction. Zulkar Nain should have said, I don't need to build any wall. No, I have the power to do whatever I want. Anyway, on the face of the earth. Allah has given me that power. So I'll just go in there and teach them the lesson of their life. And they'll never touch you again. Not after I've finished with them. But strangely, he doesn't do that. Because he does not have the power to destroy them. So we're dealing with something terrible here. These are evil beings. These are wicked people who commit facade. That which corrupts and destroys. But who have a power greater than that of Zulkarnay. He cannot destroy them. But he can do something else. He can contain them so that they are rendered helpless. In the language of a game called chess, we say you can checkmate them. <laughs> so they're rendered helpless. And he says, I don't need your money. Just help me with manpower. Bring me blocks of iron. And in that region over here, there is an abundance of iron ore up to this day up to this day. And then he took the blocks of iron 
and he built a wall, an iron wall. And then he built, built a fire and he said, blow with your bellows. And he took molten copper and poured it on the barrier to prevent rust. <coughs> when he had completed building the barrier or the wall, no, sorry, step back. He didn't say, I'm going to build for you a sud. They wanted a sud. He said, I'll build for you a rudder. A sud is any barrier, any wall. But a rudder would be a wall which is built like a dam. Like a dam. Okay? And this is precisely what he built here. Like a dam to block that side from this side. When he built it, he said, Hada rahmatun rabbi. I know this is located in the Quran. Hada rahmatun rabbi. The construction of this dam is an act of mercy from Allah. So the world is safe from these wicked beings. فَإِذَا جَاءَ وَعْدُ رَبِّي But when that time comes, when that time comes of which my Lord has warned, my Lord God has warned, جَعَلَهُ دَكَّاءَ Allah is going to bring down this barrier. وَكَانَ وَعْدُ رَبِّي حَقَّ And Allah's warning will come to pass. We pause now for two things. First of all is, I don't know whether you have it in Britain, something called Google Earth. Yes. You know what it is? You don't need to go to a travel agency and buy a ticket, okay, and fly to this part of the world to go and look for the barrier built of iron and steel, blocks of iron. You can go to Google Earth and search the whole earth from your sitting room. <coughs> not one person, from the day that the Quran was revealed to this day, not one human being <coughs> had ever seen that barrier. There is, a, there is a report in one of the books of Tafsir that the Khalifa had sent a delegation for search for the barrier. And they came back to say that they found it lying in ruins. But to this day, no one has seen the barrier standing, no one. So it looks as though they've been released. If you say they've not been released, you have a duty to the Quran. I'm talking to every single Darululum in this country. If you say they've not been released, then at least this much integrity you should have. They should go and search for the barrier. And I'm saying to you, you can go and search, but you'll never find it. Because no one has ever seen it. But so it looks as though they've been released. <coughs> but we have something else to do before we proceed. Who are Gog and Magog? Allah created three kinds of beings. <coughs> he created the angels. He created the jinn. And he created human beings. This is apart from plants and animals. So Gog and Magog have to be either angels or jinn, or human beings. Why? Because plants don't commit facade. <laughs> and animals don't commit facade. So we can eliminate plants and animals. Do angels commit facade? No. We are falun umarun. Angels act only on the basis of Allah's instruction, so eliminate angels. <coughs> so Gog and Magog have to be either 
Jinn or human beings? Can Jinn commit facade? Oh yes. And can human beings commit facade? Oh yes. So now, are Gog and Magog Jinn or human beings? Ah yes. You need, you need only five rupees worth of intelligence, not more than that, to know that you cannot contain Jinn with a barrier made of blocks of iron. <laughs> <laughs> Only five rupees worth of common sense. The jinn can pass over the barrier. The jinn can pass through the barrier. <laughs> so the implication is that Gog and Magog have to be human beings, nothing else. Good. Where do human beings live? The Quran answers. The Quran says that when Allah sent Adam alayhi salam and mankind on earth, He says, وَلَقُمْ فِي الْعَضِّ مُسْتَقَرْ That you are going to live on earth. The Quran never said you're going to live inside the interior of the earth, the bowels of the earth. Again, only five rupees worth of intelligence, you know. That's all. Not much. وَلَقُمْ فِي الْعَضِّ مُسْتَقَرْ then you'll be provided with your sustenance, your vegeta your veggies and your milk and your meat from the earth. The interior of the earth don't have any animals. <laughs> eh? No cows down there, no no goats down there, no sheep down there. I have to restrain my anger. Because I don't know where these people came from, Mars or Venus or Jupiter or where. They say Gog and Magog living down in the interior of the earth and in, this, in doing so they disrespect the Quran and they insult their own intelligence. <laughs> Manifest disrespect for the Quran. Worse than schoolboys. And they are insulting their own intelligence. Because Allah says, I sent you on earth. On earth you will live and the earth will provide you with your sustenance, your roti. Therefore, if Gog and Magog are human beings, how on earth can they be living down in the interior of the earth? If any hadith says that, would it not be in conflict with the Quran? So let us dispose of that, excuse my language, that rubbish and proceed. When Zulkarnain traveled in the direction of the setting of the sun, he gave a demonstration of the use of power. The power is used to punish the oppressor. To punish those who are wicked and unjust, who commit zulm. And when he traveled in the direction of the rising of the sun, he gave another demonstration of the use of power. When power rests on the foundations of faith, and that is power respects the rights of people, even when they are primitive people. And so when the second of the two occurrences to occur. It will have to be after Gog and Magog have been released. Are you following? There are two currents. This is the first. A second is to come. When will the second come? It will have to be after Gog and Magog is released. Then you can have the second Khan. Why? Because in the first Khan, he checkmated Gog and Magog. So in the second Khan, he will have to checkmate Gog and Magog again. Are you following me? So in between, what's going to happen? The first and the second Khan. In between, the barrier will be brought down. 
and Gog and Magog will be released. And when they are released, now there will be a power, so powerful in the world, <coughs> that even Zulkarnin cannot destroy them. That's the kind of power it is. We can now leave the Quran, having established the foundation on the Quran, to go to the Hadith. And the Hadith confirms what is in the Quran. Look at my methodology. Eh? The Prophet said, alayhi salatu wasalam, in the Hadith al Qudsi. You know what's the Hadith al Qudsi? Oh, I don't have time to check you out today. Hadith al Qudsi is the direct speech of Allah, but not in the Quran, it's in the Hadith. I have created, this is Sayyid Muslim, I have created creatures of mine. Allah is speaking. So powerful that none but I can destroy them. That's why Zulkarnain had to build the barrier. So when they are released, what kind of world would it be? It's going to be a terrible, terrible, terrible world because there will be no power in the world who will stand up to them. None. None. They will be the most powerful force in the world. And they will use their power exactly the opposite way to Zulkarnain. And so when Gog and Magog are released, power will now rest on foundations which are godless. And power will now be used to oppress. And power will not respect the rights of people. Will not respect those who have faith and who are righteous in conduct. But will target them. And power will not respect the rights of the primitive people. The primitive peoples on the face of the earth are going to be wiped out when Gog and Magog are released. Because this is the opposite to the demonstration of power from Zulkarnain. So it looks as though they have been released. Because that's what we've been experiencing for the last few hundred years. I don't know whether you, be, you had your biryani and then you went to sleep for a few hundred years, but the rest of us what we have seen these last few hundred years in the world is we have seen power. Power resting on foundations which are essentially godless. Power so powerful that none could stand up to it. And power being used ruthlessly to oppress. And power being used to destroy without any regard whatsoever for human rights, destroy the primitive way of life. And so now they are in settlements, the natives in a settlement. And usually there is a beer factory or wine factory at the beginning, so they all drink alcohol and they, they, would, be, they would not be conscious of where they are. The primitive peoples have been wiped out all over the world. So for those who have not been eating biryani and going to sleep, the rest of us, it looks very much as though the evidence is plain and clear. Not only is the barrier gone because nobody can see it anymore, but also for the last few hundred years, power in the world has been resting on foundations which are essentially godless. And that power had been used in these last few hundred years exactly the opposite way to that of Zulkarnain. To oppress and to destroy and to target those who have faith and are righteous in conduct and to destroy the primitive way of life. So, where is the evidence then from the Quran? Have they been released? <coughs> There are only two verses in the Quran 
only two, which makes mention of Gog and Magog, only two. So you have to be blind to miss it. Huh? The first one is in Surah al kaf and we already mentioned it to you. In the Yajuja, in the Yajuja wa Ma'juja Mufsiduna fil up. Surely Gog and Magog are committing facade on our land. What's that? Now where is the second one? Only two, eh? The second reference to Gog and Magog in the Quran is located in Surah al -Anbiya. But remember that Allah sent down the Qur'an لِقَوْمِ يَتَفَكَّرُونَ yes. And He also sent down in the Qur'an two kinds of verses. <laughs> Ayat Muhkamat which are plain and clear and Ayat Mutashabihat which have to be interpreted. So without the interpretation, you will not get the meaning. Allah could have said, eat and drink in the nights of Ramadan. Eat and drink until the light of the day is distinct from the darkness of the night and then begin the fast. Did he say that? No. He didn't say that. He said, eat and drink until the white thread of dawn is distinct from the black thread. Why did he do that? When he could have said, eat and drink until the light of the day is distinct from the darkness of the night. One companion put the white thread and the black thread underneath his pillow. And in the morning he looked at it to see when to start the fast. And he was having some difficulty. So he went to the Prophet Islam, who only now, not before, you must think, think, think. This Quran is not going to open its doors to you unless you think. What can I do if you refuse to think? What can I do for the Darul Uloom if they don't want to think? What can I do? Those of us who use the thinking capacity, Allah will be pleased and Allah will bless you with knowledge. And the rest will remain like cattle. So the man went to the Prophet and he said, to Islam, and he said, <laughs> When Allah said the white thread and black thread, what he meant by that was when the light of the day is distinct from the darkness of the night. Hmm? At this time the Prophet gave this ta'wil or interpretation, not before, not before. Good. And so now Allah speaks in the Quran and he speaks of a town. Did he mention the name of the town? Because you gotta think. And he says, Ba'adawzi billahi min a shaitan al rajim wa haramun ala qariyatin ahalaknaha annahum la yarjirun. A town has been destroyed. Allah destroyed it. The people have been expelled. Allah expelled them for their wickedness. And having expelled them, He placed a ban on them that they could never retain, return to this town to reclaim it as their own kabhinahi. <coughs> Which town 
if this. And then comes the second ayah. Hatta Ida futi hat ya ajuju wa ma ajuju. Wa hum min kulli hadabin yansilu. That the people of this town are banned. They can never return to this town until Allah brings down that barrier and Gog and Magog are released and when they are released with their indestructible power they spread out in all directions and therefore they take control of power in the world. Is that so difficult to understand? When that happens then these people will be brought back to this town from which they had been expelled. There are many ways by which we can recognize the town. But unfortunately, we prefer to eat biryani and go home and sleep. It is so sad. And no matter how much I lecture and lecture and lecture on this subject, they say, no, we prefer to eat biryani and go home and sleep. And even after tonight's lecture, they will still respond the same way, but not you and not the young people in this country. The young people in this country will listen to me and say, if they refuse to think, leave them away and go forward. Leave them aside and move forward if they don't want to think. That's how the young people in this country will respond. One of the first ways to identify the town is that the Quran identified it. Hmm? The Quran explains Qarn. Which Qarn is it? Is it a horn or is it an age or an epoch or people? So the Quran again explains the Korea. Uh, it is the um, Surah uh, Al-Baqarah, uh, around 257, I think. I just checked it out. And Allah speaks about a town. And a traveler is passing by the town. A town which is lying in ruins. And this traveler says, I don't know how can Allah ever re revive this to life. It's destroyed, finish. And then Allah caused him to die for a hundred years. And then raised him back to life. And when he came back to life after a hundred years, uh, how long have you been here? Maybe a day or part of a day. Okay, look at your food. Um, I don't know if it's biryani. <laughs> the food is still fresh. <laughs> now look at your donkey. <laughs> the donkey starved to death. The, bon the, bon the flesh of the donkey, donkey rotted. Bones remain. And then the bones turned to dust in a hundred years. So the, the Allah then caused the donkey to come back to life to show him how he can bring life back to the dead. And the commentator of the Quran, uh, Ibn Kathir, confidently declares that this town is Jerusalem. Here's one example of the Quran using the term Korea, Korea for Jerusalem. Your homework now is to go and search the Quran. I have to give you some homework. And see where else in the Quran has Allah used the word Qariya. And the commentators of the Quran have recognized it to be Jerusalem. So we can use this method to identify the Qariya or town as Jerusalem. There's another way we can do it. And that is that this town is connected with Gog and Magog because Gog and Magog are going to be the ones 
would bring the people back to the town. And Gog and Magog really belong to Alamat Sah. And proper methodology is to take all the Alamat Sah as a whole and see what is that which binds them together harmoniously. And when you take the, all the Alamat to Sah, all the signs of the last day, in which Gog and Magog are located, and to see what is that nucleus, that central power, central figure around which all the rest of Alamantu Sah revolves, it is the return of Nabi Isa Islam. Wa innahu, when you recite the Quran in Surah Al Zukhra, you'll find the Quran that you have now in your hand saying, Wa innahu la ilmul li Oh, really? You know what that means? That he is the knowledge of the hour. Which implies that the knowledge of the hour is with him. He is the knowledge of the hour. Not he is the sign of the hour. He is the knowledge of the hour. That the knowledge of the hour is with him. And even the Christians predict that. Even the gospel says, the Son of God does not know when the last hour will come. Only the Father knows. <laughs> That's what in the Gospel today, up to today. Only the Father knows the Son doesn't know. <laughs> so if the Gospel is telling you, you read the Quran wrongly. Because the ilm is only with Allah. Only with Allah. So it should be read the other way. There are two ways of reading it. <coughs> two ways. Some, many verses of the Quran are like that. They admit of two readings. <coughs> Either wa innahu la ilmul lisa'a wa innahu la alamul lisa'a. Obviously, this is the one that fits. Wa innahu la alamul lisa'a. He is the sign par excellence of Akhiru Zaman. So Gog and Magog have to fit with the signs of Akhiru Zaman which all revolve around the Isa <laughs> And so the Qariya has to be a Qariya which fits also in this link to Akhiru Zaman. Which Qariya it is in the world which is linked with Nabi Isa Is it Washington? <laughs> no. There's only one city in the world, important city in the world, connected with Nabi Isa al-Islam, and that is Jerusalem, where the temple is located, Masjid al-Aqsa. And he went, he went into the masjid, and he turned over their tables, and he chased them out of the masjid, and he said, you've taken the house of Allah and transformed it into a den of thieves. So this is the second way of identifying the town as Jerusalem. Okay? Um, there's a third way of identifying the town as Jerusalem. We said that this town is connected with Gog and Magog. Because it's Gog and Magog who will bring them back to the town. So we take all the hadith on Gog and Magog. All of them. There are 11 in Sahih Bukhari. But there are total of about 51 completely. And see whether in any of these ahadiths is there a link between Gog and Magog and a town. Yes, there is. Yes. When Gog and Magog are released, they will pass by the Sea of Galilee on their way to Baytul Maqdis, Jerusalem. Do we need to go further? Or have we already established now to your satisfaction? That when Allah says, وَحَرَمٌ عَلَىٰ قَرْيَةٍ أَهْلَقْنَاهَا أَنَّهُمْ لَا يَرْجِعُونَ That the town he's speaking of is Jerusalem. And when he spoke about the people who were, dis who were the town was destroyed, it was Jerusalem, and the people who were expelled were Banu Israel. And then a ban was placed on them for 2,000 years, they could not return. 
So when you see the Jews being brought back to the Holy Land, now listen to me carefully. The Quran is speaking now. When you see the Jews being brought back to the Holy Land, to Jerusalem, to reclaim it as their own, and those who are bringing them back are people who use power to oppress. <laughs> you know that Gog and Magog have been released. And it is Gog and Magog who have brought them back to the Holy Land to reclaim it as their own. We have to stop now. It's time for Salat al Maghrib. And we'll continue, inshallah, after Salat al Maghrib. 43, 44 time has. Assalamu alaikum brothers and sisters and respected elders. If you'd like to take your seats, inshallah, we will uh, resume with the speech uh, and it's an Islamic view of uh, Kaga Magag. <coughs> and inshallah, I'll pass it back over to the Sheikh. <laughs> We have now reached that point in time in our lecture when it is possible for us to identify Gog and Magog. They are human beings. They are a people who have been given a power which none can destroy other than Allah. Even God, even Zulkarnain cannot destroy the power. But Zulkarnain can render them helpless to commit fasad on them, contain them, protect us from them. That's what Zulkarnain can do. And we use the term checkmate. <laughs> render them harmless, to checkmate them, to render them harmless, to put them in jail, for example. And we found that the Quran is telling us that there is a town, and we have identified, identified it as Jerusalem, and that Allah destroyed the town, and he expelled the people of the town who are Banu Israel mm -hmm. and then placed a ban on them that they could never return to this town to reclaim it as their own. And indeed, they could not for 2,000 years. But when Gog and Magog are released, and when Gog and Magog have spread out in all directions, وَهُمْ مِنْ كُلِّ حَدَبٍ يَنْسِرُونَ then they'll take control of power in the world. And they will use that power to oppress. They will use that power to liquidate the primitive way of life, right rough shed over the primitive peoples. They will exploit and oppress mankind to do their own business to achieve their own ends, to build a new heaven across the Atlantic Ocean, a new paradise across the Atlantic Ocean, and to build it overnight. And they do it on the backs of millions and millions of slaves that they oppress in the most barbaric form of slavery mankind has ever, ever experienced. When Gog and Magog are released, therefore, the world is going to be a terrible place. A, a very famous poet of India, his name was Dr. Muhammad Iqbal, <coughs> once had the insight that the Darul Uloom still does not have to this day, up to this day. But it was around 1917, 
which is a hundred years ago, that this famous poet published a verse in poetry, which was read by the whole of India, all of them. Listen to what he said. All the forces of Gog and Magog have now been released. Chashme Muslim Dekhle Tafsir Harfi Yansilu. The Muslims must now direct their attention to the Quran and to that passage in the Quran which ends with the word Yansilun. And that is the one we have just quoted. Iqbal was absolutely correct. Did the Darul pay any attention to him? A hundred years have passed and Iqbal's voice has been crying in the wilderness for reasons beyond my capacity to explain. The institutions of Islamic, higher Islamic learning should be at the forefront of Islamic scholarship, explaining with the Quran the world today. The institutions of Islamic learning, of higher Islamic learning, have failed and failed miserably and dangerously so. to turn to the Qur'an. But the Qur'an can explain, for example, the oppression of the last 500 years. And so the scholars of Islam who have failed and failed miserably to turn to the Qur'an, that the Qur'an could explain the world to the as Iqbal just did, would prepare, must, must prepare themselves to answer before Allah on Judgment Day. That's all I have to say to them. And so now, who are those who brought the Jews back to the Holy Land to reclaim it as their own after 2,000 years? Was it the Chinese? Was it the Japanese? Who was it? There's only one answer. It is modern Western civilization. Is Russia a part of modern Western civilization? Anyone who says that Russia is a part of the West should buy a one-way ticket to the moon. <laughs> the West has waged endless wars on Russia, endless wars, and are now preparing to wage what they don't know, their last war. This is their last war that they'll ever wage. Russia is now a part of the West. Those who brought the Jews back to the Holy Land to reclaim it as their own. Two thousand years after Allah had expelled them, expelled them and banned their return, belonged to modern Western civilization. And the dominant characteristic of modern Western, the dominant characteristics of modern Western civilization are that inside of this uh, civilization there is a mysterious reconciliation between a part of the Christian world and a part of the Jewish world. (coughs) 
And Allah speaks about that. Reconciliation and friendship and alliance between Christians and Jews. And he warns us about it. But those who are taking weapons and taking money from Santa Claus to wage their bogus jihad in Syria, they don't want to study the Quran. No. So wait and prepare yourself for the day when you have to answer. لا تتخذ اليهود والنصارى أولياء Do not take Jews, which Jews is a lot of people. <coughs> Do not take Christians, which Christians is a lot talking about, as your friends and allies. Allah answers the question in the follow words that follow. بعدهم أولياء there is the answer. Ba'aduhum awliya Do not take such Jews and do not take such Christians as your friends and allies who themselves are friends and allies of each other. If you explain this eye of the Quran differently, prepare yourself. Prepare yourself. This is the correct explanation of the Quran. Whosoever from amongst you turn to them, you no longer belong to this Ummah. You're gone. You've left this Ummah. You now belong to them. <coughs> Surely Allah does not provide guidance for wicked people. This is the first characteristic of modern Western civilization. That at its heart there is a mysterious Judeo-Christian alliance <coughs> that Allah has warned us about in the Quran. The second thing about this mysterious Western civilization is that it developed a power unprecedented in human history. No civilization on the face of the earth could stand in their way for 500 years. Where did they get that power from? How did they get it? An amazing scientific and technological revolution which has now reached the age of cryptocurrencies <laughs> and Bitcoin and uh, blockchain technology and so on. And 31 times in the Quran, not just once or twice, but 31 times in the Quran, in one surah, Surah Al-Rahman, 31 times he's knocking and knocking and knocking on our mind. فَبِأَيِّ آلَاءِ رَبِّكُمَا كُمَا 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 To Kedzeban. Two people who are rejecting the truth from Allah. And these two people are evil. <laughs> and he gives us the capacity to recognize them. That they are human beings and they are jinn because he says, Ya ma'ashar al-jinni wal-ins. And he gives us a further capacity to recognize them because they are the ones who are going to end Engage in space exploration. In this tata'atum and tanfudu min aqtari samawati wa lab. Tanfudu. This is the civilization that did it. Huh? But in the Quran Allah says, we're going to deal with you. We're not going to continue to oppress mankind indefinitely. A time will come when we'll deal with you. So nafrugu lakum And he also tells us how he's going to deal with them. Yursalu alaykuma shuwazun min naar wa nuhaz. We're going to send against you a blaze of fire followed by smoke. Fadat al-tasirah. 
And on that day, there will be no help for you. And we know when that happens, it's going to be affecting the world of Christianity and the world of Judaism. Not so much the Chinese and the Buddhist and the Hindu world, but the world of Christianity and the world of Judaism. When this great change comes over the world and the oppressor gets his wing, his wings cut off because Allah says, and we quoted last night, where it's called Allah Huya Isa, in Nimuta Wafik, where I feel Kailea, where Mutahiro Kaminella in a Kafaro. Oh Jesus, I'm going to take your soul, I'm going to raise you, and I'm going to cleanse you of all the filth that they heard on you. Those who rejected you as the mass messiah and said you're a liar. And who declared of your mother that she committed sin and that you're a bastard. And those who joined with them in alliance. I'm going to cleanse you of these people, this rubbish. How will he cleanse them? How will he cleanse them? وَجَعِلُ الَّذِينَ تَبَعُوكَ I'm going to cause those who follow you, who will never declare that a man can marry another man and get a marriage certificate. Not in a million years! That world of Christianity that follows Jesus, even when they declare that he is God and he is the Son of God, because Nabi Isa Islam says Allah can forgive them. Read your Quran if you don't believe me. وَجَعِلُوا الَّذِينَ تَبَعُوكَ فَوْكَ الَّذِينَ كَفَرُوا I'm going to turn the tables. And this Judeo-Christian alliance which has been hurling all this rubbish and garbage on you is going to be defeated and brought down low. And this side which follows you will be raised above them and dominant over them. And when the tables are turned, <coughs> It will remain like that until the end of the world. So now, all that remains is the second of the two currents. Remember we started with that. The second of the two currents has to come. And in between these two, Gog and Magog have to be released. And when they are released, they have to spread out in all directions, take control of the world, the world order of Gog and Magog, and be the most powerful force of oppression mankind has ever witnessed. Everything stands, it falls down before them, everything. No one can stand up to them. Not even Tipu Sultan. <coughs> And then you see them bring the Jews back to the Holy Land to reclaim it as their own. That's in between this current and that current. But this is not going to last forever. So Allah is saying, I'm going to bring the curtain down on this civilization. I'm going to bring the curtain down on this civilization. And when I bring the curtain down on this civilization, it will be a flash of fire followed by smoke. <coughs> Even if we die in the great war which is to come, but we die with our hearts in the right place. When we are raised, we will <coughs> smile. There'll be light on our faces. Surah to Rahman, Surah to Rahman, Surah to Rahman. Yes? So don't be afraid to die. Don't be afraid to die. Now then, when will the second Karm come? The second Karm will have to be those who follow <coughs> the Israelites and Jesus. 
the second cult, those who follow him. They are the ones who must now remain, become dominant in the world. And when he returns, he will return as Hakimul Adil. So he returns to rule. Is he coming back to the Ummah of Muhammad No. Who is he coming back to? He's coming back to his Ummah. His Ummah. His Ummah. Go to the Quran. Go to the Quran and do your homework. So there is going to be a ruling state in the world, meaning a Khilafah state, a Khilafah state, over which Nabi Isa Islam, Jesus will rule. And of course it will have to be from Jerusalem. And the Messiah will rule the world from Jerusalem exactly as the Jews believe he would. So a people who follow him will be raised above these people and then they will become the ruling state in the world and they will remain in that power, position of power and dominance until the end of the world. Naturally NATO doesn't like this. <laughs> NATO doesn't like this. But our message to NATO from Birmingham is that your 500 years of oppression over the world is about to come to an end. And praise is due to Allah to set the Quran. That the Quran could explain what nothing else can explain. Only the Quran can explain. Now when the second of the two comes is to come, the world will witness power resting on the foundations of faith and that power manifesting itself, where is the, here. That power will manifest itself here in the Black Sea area. And it will be a people who follow Nabi Isa al-Islam, Jesus, the Christian people. And they will use power to resist the oppressor, not to oppress. Russia is very much like Pakistan. <laughs> the people of Pakistan have never had the freedom to have their own rulers. No. The rulers have always been chosen from outside. And the rulers rule on behalf of their masters outside. <laughs> Even though the people of Pakistan despise what their rulers are doing. Similar with Russia. Similar with Russia. <coughs> that there were Tsars who ruled over Russia, but these Tsars were chosen from outside of Russia. And they were following an agenda that came from the West. And these are the Tsars who waged wars of oppression against Muslims to so give Russia a bad name as an oppressor. And they they were unjust and oppressive against Muslims, they slaughtered Muslims, they destroyed Muslims in order to give Russia a bad name. So that between Russia and Muslims there will be hatred and enmity. <laughs> and then when these Tsars did a particularly good job then the Western world gave them the title Great. Peter the Great. Catherine the Great. <laughs> Because they did the work they were, we wanted them to do. So Russia was not an oppressor of Muslims. No. It is those who hijack Russia. Like they hijacked Pakistan so many times. They are the ones who did the work to sabotage the relationship between the followers of Nabi Muhammad and the followers of Nabi Isa Islam. And I hope that this lecture may reach Russia and may reach the Balkans, and reach Greece, and reach Belgrade. The Black Sea is today controlled by Russia. Two years ago, or three years ago, Russia recovered Crimea. They planned their plans. I don't have the time 
to tell you what were their plans. But then Allah planned His plans and their plans backfired on them. And instead of choking Russia by the neck, Russia was able to turn the tables on them and become a Crimea. And when Russia, when Russia, where is Crimea? Can you show me Crimea? When Russia recovered Crimea, yeah, 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 that's Crimea. That's Crimea. When Russia recovered Crimea, Russia now as a nuclear power now controls the entire Black Sea area. Your projection of power, nuclear power. So what has happened in the last three years is that power has returned to the Black Sea area. Unprecedented power. But power resting on the foundations of faith. The Soviet Union also controlled this area. But that was power resting on the foundations of godlessness. And this is power resting on the foundations of faith. Russia is returning to Orthodox Christianity. Russian diplomacy today is the most morally upright in the whole world. <laughs> Russia doesn't lie. No. Russia doesn't tell lies. If Russia had not intervened in Syria, the Syrian Christians would have been slaughtered by Dajjal's warriors who went there to wage their bogus jihad. And if the, Rus if, the, if, the, if the Syrian Christians had been slaughtered at this time, it would have been the end to any possibility of Muslims and Orthodox Christians having friendship and alliance with each other. Yes. If these Dajjal's warriors had succeeded in Syria, Russia would have lost the naval base, where is it, in Syria, we don't have it here. And Russia would have been finished in that region of the world. So their bogus jihad in Syria was actually to cut Russia's throat. But look at how Allah has planned his plans. The Russia now controls the Black Sea, exactly the area where Zulkarnain came the first time. And Russia now has a military superiority over the West and they can't tolerate that. But for the first time in 500 years, the oppressor is now face to face with someone who is resisting him and who has military superiority over him and praise is due to Allah. And so the second current has now come. And the second current has come to the Orthodox Christian world led by Russia. <coughs> Putin can be here today and be gone tomorrow. So when we speak about Zulkarnain, we don't speak about an individual. I will not speak an individual. I will say the second of the two currents is the Orthodox Christian world led by Russia that is returning to Orthodox Christianity. <coughs> if this is correct, then we see that in this region of the world, where there was a people, who were living a primitive way of life. And Zulkarnain Kazali left them as he, as he met them, respecting the rights of the indigenous people. Russia must display the same kind of behavior of respect for human rights. And Russia is doing that. Respect for human rights. And now comes the last part. That in the same way that Gog and Magog were contained the first time. Not destroyed, contained. So they were in the harmless. Gog and Magog will have to be contained a second time for Karnain. And so now we who have the Quran, we already know the outcome 
of the great war which is around the corner. We know that in this great war which is coming, the Western world will be contained in the, that region of the world which is over here, the north of the Holy Land area. They will be rendered helpless. They will be checkmated in this part of the world. We know something else. We know from Surah Al-Rahman, Fanfuzu. La tanfuzuna illa bi sultan. That you are able to send your intercontinental ballistic nuclear missiles all over the place and have your military satellite stations revolving around the earth and so on and your robotic submarines at the bottom of the earth, the bottom of the ocean. Allah says that this is possible for you only because of authority. So implicit, la tanfuzuna illa bi sultan, implicit, because you got to think. Implicit <coughs> is that Allah can withdraw, withhold authority anytime he wants. And since he says, sanafrugu lakum thakalan, it is a plain and clear as daylight now, that he is going to withhold authority in the great war which is coming. And when he withholds the territory, then their missiles will not fly. Because Allah can send thousands and thousands of angels. He sent them at the Battle of Badr and they fought with us. And it takes only one angel to take one guided misguided and they get misguided. I don't know. NATO will be able to digest the dinner now. And so their missiles can go all over the place. But these will be accurate. Because Allah says, I'm going to destroy every town and every city. Allah is going to destroy every town and every city which ought to be destroyed. Number one on the list, anywhere where a man can marry another man and get a marriage to keep, you're going to be destroyed. So a missile coming from the other side will destroy you. But a missile from this side is not going to go anywhere. This is how the second of the two currents will result in Gog and Magog being contained in the north. Is that the end of Gog and Magog? No. There's one last piece of this lecture. The Prophet said that Islam to Islam that when they are released, <coughs> Gog and Magog, <coughs> the first of them will pass by the Sea of Galilee. Can we get that? There we are. Here we are, the Sea of Galilee. The first of them will pass by the Sea of Galilee on their way to Jerusalem. Oh, we don't have Jerusalem here. Jerusalem somewhere on here. So they're coming from the north. Ah, here we are. This is Jerusalem there. And the Sea of Galilee will be somewhere about, about there. It's at the top. Here we are. <coughs> sea of Galilee. And uh, they're coming from the north down to the south. The first of them will pass by the Sea of Galilee and start to drink the water. And by the time the last of them pass, they'll say there used to be water here. Which could mean one of two things. Which could mean that the water level will go down very, very, very low. Or it could mean it's going to dry up completely. I am now inclined to the first meaning, first meaning, okay? That there used to be water here means there used to be a lot of water here. Now look at it. Today the, the Sea of Galilee is precisely that. It cannot recover anymore. It's low, very low. So it means that when you see the Sea of Galilee with very little water left, 
The implication is that most of Gog and Magog have already left the north and are down concentrated in the Holy Land. So when the Great War takes place and Russia defeats NATO in the north, that's not the end of Gog and Magog. No. no, because they have already left the north and they've gone down to the Holy Land. So they now be concentrated in the Holy Land, although Russia will control the north. And in the Holy Land they will now wage war <coughs> until Nabi Isa Islam returns. And they'll wage war on him as well. <laughs> and he'll go up a mountain. And pray to, and the mountain is in Jerusalem. And pray to Allah. <coughs> and then Allah will destroy Gog and Magog. Zulkarnin cannot destroy Gog and Magog. When Allah destroys Gog and Magog, then he will send something which will attack them at the back of their necks. And they'll fall on and by next morning they're all dead and their bodies are beginning to decay, decompose. Which looks like biological warfare. <laughs> biological warfare. That Gog and Magog are reduced, the, the, the immune system is reduced to a state of zero. Zero. And they will take all of mankind with them. So when they die with a biological effect and they, the doctors will say, well, there's no more left now for, what do you call it, um, antibiotics. We don't have any more antibiotics left. <coughs> you know that you're following <coughs> Gog and Magog. You know that you're following Gog and Magog. <coughs> Your immune system is going lower and lower and lower and lower. Your children, immune system is going lower and lower and lower and lower. So when Allah sends a biological attack at the back of the necks, they cannot resist and they all fall and die. And all those who follow them will also fall and die. Hadith of the Prophet which he said, it is in it is in uh, Sahih Bukhari four times. And it's Hadith of Qudsi. And uh, it is the day of judgment and Allah speaks to Adam alayhi salam and says to Adam alayhi salam, take out the people for Jahannam. <laughs> and he asks, oh Allah, how many are they? And Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala replies and says, out of every 1,000, take 999 for Jahannam. the mother of all warnings. <coughs> the companions of the Prophet were terrified when they heard that. And he smiled and he said, good news for you. The one for Jannah will be from you, meaning someone in the religion of Islam. And the religion of Islam is not restricted to the Ummah of Muhammad but he went on to say that the 999 will all be Ahlu Yajud or Majud. Meaning if you die the way they die, because your immune system is reduced to helplessness, you become a part of the Jamaat of Gog and Magog. And when you become a part of the Jamaat of Gog and Magog and you die, you go into the hellfire. One last thing before I end. There's a difference between releasing and sending. The Quran speaks of release of Gog and Magog. Hatta idha futihat. Futihat. Fataha. Fat is to open. Idha futihat ya'juj wa ma'juj. The Quran speaks of the release of Gog and Magog, release. But the Hadith speaks about when Nabi Sa'ala Islam returns. It says, فَبَعَثَ اللَّهِ فَبَعَثَ اللَّهِ فَبَعَثَ بَعَثَ is not to release. Ba'atha is to send. 
So when Allah sends Gagan Magad, when the Isa Ali Islam returns, it will be for their final destruction. But Islamic scholarship, it is a matter of embarrassment for me, disrespected the Quran, and there'll be a price for it. By turning to a solitary hadith to study Gog and Magog, and not bothering with the Quran at all, and using this hadith to misunderstand it, and to come to the conclusion, this is Darul Rum Islam. And if my language is bitter, it's because I'm teaching this subject for 20 years now or more. And they refuse to listen to me. Ba'atha is to send. Allah will send the Gaga and Magad. And they will then be destroyed. But they say no. They say Allah will release Gog and Magog only after Nabi Isa Islam returns. So there is no question of Gog and Magog being in this world before the return of Nabi Isa Islam. <coughs> that pathetic position is that of the Darul Rum. If today my language is harsh, they deserve it. They deserve it. <coughs> because I've been talking and talking and talking and talking to them for 20 years or more, but they will not listen to me. No, Imran Hussein is wrong. So today I say to them, you better prepare yourself to defend yourself on judgment day for having betrayed the Quran. We pray that Allah may bless our gathering here tonight. That you may have the knowledge of the Quran. That Allah may bless you with the knowledge of the Quran. That Allah may bless you with that which is in the Quran, which explains the world today. But Allah will only bless you with that knowledge if you are faithful to the book of Allah. ربنا تقبل منا إنك أنت السميع العليم وتعلينا يا مولانا إنك أنت التواب الرحيم برحمتك يا رب العالمين. السلام عليكم. We'll open the floor for question and answers. Inshallah, we've got. Somebody assisting with the sisters. If the sisters have any questions, if you could, inshallah, note those down and give them to the delegated sister and we'll get them passed over. Inshallah, we pass it on to the sheikh. Um, it's time with the brothers downstairs. Um, the floor is open to yourselves. Any questions for the sheikh? Brother Dan, yeah. Sheikh, so the hadith where Gog and Magog are trying to break the barrier. They're unsuccessful until they say, Inshallah, is this a solitary one? There is a hadith quoted by Ibn Kathir in his book on Alamat al that Gog and Magog come every day and they're hitting against the wall with Batsul come in. And then at the end of every day, they say, we'll come back tomorrow, but they do not say inshallah. And then one day they decide to say inshallah, and then they're able to break the barrier. Yes. If that's it. There's nothing in this hadith which is in harmony with the Quran. Mm -hmm. Nothing. And so I relegate this hadith to a lesser status. I don't have time for it. I prefer to take those ahadiths which are in harmony with the Qur'an, I have no problem with that. Any further questions? My friend wants to know, are we living amongst the uh, um, Gog and Magog? The brother is asking, are we living amongst Gog and Magog at the moment? 
Okay, let me try to repeat the whole lecture now. <laughs> I just need an hour and a half. <laughs> Did I not say that uh, those who brought the Jews back to the Holy Land are uh, identified in the Quran as God of Marat? Did I not say that modern Western civilization brought them back to the Holy Land? And therefore those who control power, those who control power in the modern Western world, they are Gog and Magog. Sheikh, would you... I have a question. In Surah Rahman, uh, verse number 33, it says, Yama shal jinni wal insi in istatatum adban yeah, I know the ayah. What's the question? It says jinn as well. Ins and oh. jinn. What is the reference for jinn in that? Oh, you were not here yesterday. Was it yesterday? <laughs> well, I lecture you on this subject? Yes. Oh, you were not here yesterday. No. Should I repeat yesterday's lecture? <laughs> 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 uh, it's going to take some time to answer this. Yeah. Uh, that the Quran speaks about Suleiman alayhi salam. So you have to go to Surah al-Saba and uh, locate where the, the jinn are placed at his disposal. And then you have to go to Surah al-Sad with the jasad. And then you'll have to recognize that until that battle all comes and consume the staff, the jasad will be able to use the jinn. And because the jasad is using the jinn, and the jinn don't know that he is not Suleiman, the, the, the modern Western world has been able to get jinn to help them and support them in their evil work all these 500 years. But it's coming to an end now. When Dabat will out consume the stuff, the stuff will fall down, the jinn will then realize this is not Suleiman, this is someone else. I, I shortcut for you, I don't know if you understand what I'm saying about it. <laughs> But the others who will be listening to me, they know. Well, I just took half an hour and gave you half a minute. Is that something which is covered in any of your books? I did not put it in a lesson. Uh, my last book on Dajjal will have some part, some reference to it, yes. But it is new knowledge that Allah has given to me, which is not yet. My new book will come, will have it in it. I hope I can finish it by the end of this. Oh, but I have several lectures now delivered here in England, just waiting to be put on YouTube. So just wait for those lectures to come. I, I delivered this lecture in... Um, Dewsbury. In Dewsbury, yeah. In Dewsbury. And he's going to put it on YouTube sometime, maybe before Christmas, inshallah. Maybe. <laughs> <laughs> Sheikh, uh, we, uh, as part of the Islamic um, knowledge, we are told about Imam al-Mahdi. Uh, following your lectures, you have said very little about Imam al-Mahdi. What's your thought about, what's your opinion about Imam al-Mahdi? I have a chapter. The question is on Imam al-Mahdi. We have a sister sitting upstairs who also has this question, but much bigger than yours. Can I just tie that question in with this question? Because the sister's quoted the question which she asked Go yesterday. Um, how can Imam al-Mahdi bring about peace and justice when people of Fasad remain in control to establish peace and justice, power no power and authority is required, which will remain with Gog and Magog. How can Imam Mahdi and Gog and Magog uh, simultaneously uh, spread peace and justice uh, with, the with the facade across the world? Imam al-Mahdi will not emerge. Allah will not send him until Dajjal has completed his mission. Have you studied the subject? Would you know what I'm talking about? Huh? When I say this, that Imam al-Mahdi will not be sent by Allah until the Dajjal has completed his mission. No, you don't know the subject. <laughs> and you're already defying me. Wait, take a little time and study the subject. Allah has spoken in the Quran of the restoration of the Khilafah state in this Ummah. Surah to nur of the Quran. And uh, I gave this lecture in London, just wait for it to get on YouTube. I don't know what is happening now. I give a lecture and I have to wait one month before it gets onto YouTube. Welcome to England. 
وعد الله الذين آمنوا منكم وعملوا الصالحات Allah has made a promise unto those from amongst you who have faith, because there are many who are part-time Muslims. Those from amongst you who have faith and whose conduct is righteous. لَيَسْتَخْلِفَنَّهُمْ فِي الْأَرْضِ That we're going to establish them with the Khilafah state on earth. <laughs> and when we do that, we do it in the same manner as we did it for those who came before. So Allah is telling you, if you will take a little time to listen. That's all. Well. <coughs> مَا كُنَّ فِي أَصْحَابِ السَّعِيرِ If we used to take a little time to listen, not that it come to one ears and go to their ears. أَوْ نَعَكِلُ When we used to think we would not be the hellfire today. So listen. Allah says, I'm going to restore the Khilafah state for you. Not for all of you. Not for the part-time Muslims. وَعَدَ اللَّهُ الَّذِينَ آمَنُوا مِنْكُمْ وَعَمِلُوا الصَّالِحَاتِ That I'm going to establish the Khilafah, restore the Khilafah state for you as I did it for those before you. As I did it for those before you. كَمَا اسْتَخْلَفَ الَّذِينَ مِنْ قَبْلِ مِنْ قَبْلِ When Allah established the Khilafah state the first time, He appointed, He sent and He appointed the Khalifa. It was Nabi Dawood al-Islam. When Allah established the Khilafah state the second time, He chose and He appointed and He sent the Khalifa. It was Nabi Muhammad al-Islam. And that Khilafah state, the first one, ended with the death of Suleiman al-Islam. Rabbana firli wahabli mulkan la yambagi li ahadi min ba'di. That the Khilafah state must end when I die. I don't want him to inherit it. The second Khilafah state continued for some time after the death of the Prophet Islam and then Allah raised it. And when Allah raised it, then it was replaced by Mulk and Ad, a, an oppressive rule. And that was replaced by Mulk and Jibriya, coercive rule. And then said the Prophet Islam, uh, um, Khilafat and ala minhaj in Nabuwa will return. And this is what the Quran is saying here. Khilafat and ala minhaj in Nabuwa will return. Okay? But when Allah established both these Khilafah states, it was on the basis of His sending someone <laughs> to be the Khalifa. Not to an election. Not to Shura. <laughs> no. So when He says, Allah is going to restore the Khilafah state. Is Allah doing it? So it has to be someone appointed by Allah. Who is there who is going to be appointed by Allah? Does the Quran inform us? Does Nabi Muhammad al-Islam inform us? Yes, he has. He has told us, but you don't want to listen. He has said that there is going to be an Imam known as Imam al-Mahdi that Allah will send. How will Allah restore a Khilafah state the third time, different from the first and second? When He has said in the Qur'an, كَمَا اسْتَخْلَفَ الَّذِينَ مِنْ قَبْلِهِمْ That I am going to restore the Khilafah state for you in the manner in which I establish it before you. 
How did Allah establish it before you? Every time Allah established the Khilafah state, it was always on the basis of a Khalifa who he appointed. Not through elections, not through Shura, Allah appointed. And the only person we have in Islam who's going to be appointed by Allah after Nabi Muhammad whether you like it or whether you don't, it's Imam al-Mahdi. Do you have any other questions for so, uh, What we'll do is I'll ask some of the sisters questions and then I'll come back to the brothers. Um, one of the sisters asked here, regarding the hadith, the sun will rise in the west. You believe that this is a metaphorical and has already occurred. Uh, what is your opinion on this and regarding the doors of Tawbah being closed, which is also a part of it? If you want to wait, <coughs> if you want to wait for the sun to rise from the west, literally, go ahead and wait. That's all. Go ahead and wait. I find it more convenient to go to the Quran for my guidance. You can choose your guidance wherever you want. When I go to the Quran for my guidance, the Quran tells me, I mean, N N Nasa could say something else, but the Quran tells me that Allah causes the sun to rise from the east and set in the west, full stop, that's enough for me. That's enough for me. Do we have any other questions? My question Can I just get that brother, one second, we'll come back to you, just that brother there. Yeah, um, isn't Isa ibn Maryam coming back as a follower of Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam? Have you been in, have you been in Birmingham or you came from somewhere outside? <laughs> no, well, I'm, I'm you, you came from here? Yeah, yeah, I'm from Birmingham. Well, you, it's the first time you come today. No, no, because I've heard all the scholars told me that, you know, that he's coming. No, no, I'm asking, is this the first time you've come? What, to this machine? To my, you know, you never heard it. No, it's <laughs> I should ask the Sheikh over here to teach you the subject because I have repeated it so many times, so many times, so many times, so many times. When Allah sent Nabi Isa alayhi islam the first time, He sent him as the head of an ummah, not as a follower. And He sent him to Banu Israel. <coughs> In order for him to come back a second time in a different capacity, then there must be something called Nasr. Nasik wa Mansukh. That Allah cancels something previously there. So you have to give to me in the Quran, the evidence in the Quran, that Allah has committed Nasr on this. And he's going to send Nabi Isa Islam back in a different capacity. And if you come to me with Hadith, I'll tell you that's the door, leave. Hadith comes only after the Quran. You don't bring the Quran, the Hadith first, you bring the Quran first. And when it comes to Nas, it is the Quran that must provide you with the evidence. The Quran and only the Quran. Evidence that there is Nas. There's no such evidence in the Quran. So, not so the same way that Nabi Isa Islam came the first time, that's the same way he'll come back the second time. He's not coming to this Ummah. No. But is he coming back as a prophet to his people, to his followers? Oh my gosh. <laughs> oh my gosh. I don't know how a Muslim could possibly think. How could he possibly think? When Allah has sent him as a Nabi, and Allah has not said anything to the contrary, that he's going to come back in some other capacity, then who is going to say it? Who has the authority? Who has the authority? Only Allah has the authority. No one else. It is strange and mysterious to me <coughs> that we do not show the proper respect for the Quran. Guidance must come from the Quran, proper methodology. Otherwise, you're going to go all over the place. You're going to go all over the place and you're going to end up misguided. Please, please listen to me. The Quran must be your primary source of guidance. 
you never go astray. And the hadith is to be accepted immediately. As soon as you see that it is in harmony with the guidance of the Quran. And if a hadith is in conflict with the guide with the Quran, put it aside. But when there are hadith which are neither in harmony nor in conflict, yes, you can accept them. But they have a lower status. And you leave that for later. Okay? Nabi Isa is a prophet. Always a prophet. And will remain a prophet until Allah says he's not a prophet. <laughs> My question is about your lectures, chrono chronological order of your lectures, venues and dates, where one can find the precise information about the lecture you're delivering and the venue you do, which you're delivering at. Because YouTube doesn't, it's, it's, it's got everything. Uh, we, we are in a difficult situation in Britain. <coughs> if I make the mistake of lecturing before a thousand people, you won't see me here again. <laughs> No, you won't see me here again. In order for me to survive in this country, I have to speak to small gatherings. That's democracy. I have to speak to small gatherings. And I have to be low profile. That's the price I have to pay. So we don't have any publicity for my lectures. What we're doing is we're establishing, or we have established a Google group email address. Um, at the bottom, when this lecture comes on YouTube, you'll find a Google group email address at the bottom of the screen. So wherever you are in Britain, you can just sign up to this Google group. And whatever lectures I have, whatever seminars I have, wherever it is in Britain, the date, the time, the place will be put there. So you'll be able to get that information there, inshallah. Okay? Thank you for reminding me. Sorry. Shall we do dua first? Shall we can we just finish with the dua? Do you want? Allahumma barik lana fi rajab in shaban. After the Salat, you can bring the book for uh, autograph in Salah.